Even if you never plan to shoot a roll of film in your life, there's a lot we can learn by looking at a mechanical film camera to see how simple photography can really be. Now, of course, not all film cameras were created equal. At the height of the film era, and just before digital took over, film cameras were just as complex as the cameras that we have now, with through the lens metering for flash, automatic exposure settings, even motor drives. But the cameras that I'm concerned with here are the much simpler mechanical ones. And there's a lot of wisdom that we can glean just from looking at the features present on the camera. A good place to start is with the lens and the type of lens that would come with a camera body when you bought it at the store. When you think of a kit lens, you'll often think of an 18 to 55 millimeter or a 24 to 70 with a smaller aperture like f4. Those lenses appeal to the beginner because of the zoom range that it had and the fear of missing out. You don't want to be in a situation with the wrong focal length lens. And having something wide angle would make us really comfortable because it reminds us of what we'd see on our point and shoot cameras or on our phone. We want to document everything around us. But there comes a point where you realize you need to document something a little bit more focused. You want to get rid of distractions and have a specific subject in your composition. So commonly, the next lens you might get would be a nifty 50. A normal lens with a, a wider aperture like 1.8. And I think this is the beginning of the photography adventure for a lot of people. But here's the thing, the 50 millimeter used to be the kit lens on mechanical film cameras. So they knew back then that this was the lens that would get you going. The lens to get you a creamy background and not be so wide that your subject gets drowned out in the composition. I wonder how many 18 to 55 millimeter lenses just end up in the landfill. Because eventually, once a photographer gets going and knows the sort of pictures that they want to take, they'll niche down with either a set of primes or a good set of zooms. And regardless of the route they take, a 50 millimeter 1.8 is probably in the lens collection as well. Before autofocus lenses were mainstream, and these manual focus lenses were really common. There was a lot of data written on the lens to help a photographer out. The markings along the top were to help with zone focusing. And for example, if we're outdoors in, in bright sunlight, we could use an aperture of f16. Then the infinity symbol can get lined up with the marking for f16. And we know that everything between two and a half meters to infinity will be in focus. So that if we want to walk around, without doing detailed focusing, we can just take the shot and know that most things in that distance range will be an acceptable focus. Even though I really love zone focusing and it's a good skill to have, especially for street photography, it's being completely superseded by autofocus cameras. And it's a feature that we can probably live without. There are higher end modern autofocus lenses that still have a distance scale on the barrel, but they're nowhere near as useful as the detailed markings you'll get with a manual focus lens. And that leads us back to the aperture scale and the shutter speed dial. And one thing that you'll notice with a mechanical camera is that all of these settings are in full stops. Like your aperture will go from 2.8 to 4 to 5.6 to f8. Sometimes you get half stop marks between the full stops, but on shutter speed dials, you're usually restricted to only using full stops. And I think full stops are fine, unless you're doing high volume production work, detailed studio work, then you might want to be a little bit more precise. But even if you're being really precise with your exposures, I'd be really surprised if you're not touching your exposure dial in post-processing. So if you're gonna to touch the exposure dial anyway, why faff around with half stops? On a digital camera, the only options you usually have are between third stop and half stop increments when you move your dial. I think that's a little bit overkill. And I'd really like to see a full stop option in there because I don't want to be moving the dial more than I need to. And again, it's the simplification of exposure that speeds up the entire process. Which brings us now that we've spoke about aperture and shutter speed to ISO. And when you load your film, you're stuck with whatever speed your film was rated for. And I don't think that's a bad thing, especially when you consider that a nice middle of the road speed like 400 
is good for outdoor settings, indoor settings, studio work, and it's still got a fine enough grain that the quality of the image is good enough for most pictures. A lot of you will know that I use 400 speed on my film and digital cameras almost religiously, and I only change it if I have to. And I found that I only have to change it very rarely. Now the next dial on the top of the camera isn't for a setting, but I think it's quite important regardless. It's the rewind knob for the film. It gets to the point where you've taken 36 exposures in the case of 35 millimeter film, and you have to stop. You have to rewind the film, take the film out, load in a new roll. And that pause is gonna be a natural rest in a session, especially for portraits. The sitter's gonna get tired, distracted, and it's always good to have a little pause so that you can reset, have a chat, talk about something else before you get back into it. With digital photography, you could have your finger on the shutter button for two hours straight without any breaks whatsoever. As a photographer, you're excited to get those pictures made, but the person in front of the camera might be tired. It's important to have those little pauses to keep everyone refreshed, keep them going to the end of the session. I try and bring that lesson from the film camera to the digital one. Every 36 or 50 images, we'll have a little pause, a little rest, so that everyone can be refreshed, and then we'll push through. And then we get to the back of the camera, and the biggest difference that we have between film and digital photography, the lack of the rear screen. We can't see a picture just after it's been taken. And I'm not one of those film photographers that says not being able to see your picture the minute it's taken is a blessing. I don't think it is. I really appreciate being able to see the picture on the screen so that I can instantly learn, correct, and make a better picture. But there is something to be said for treating each frame like it's precious. There is the sense that every time you press the shutter button, it is costing you something. And that fear is a very useful thing to have. It means that every time you almost press the shutter button, you're thinking, is this picture worth it? Is it gonna be good? And it'll stop you from taking throwaway frames. Throwaway frames on a digital camera might seem like they're free, but they're gonna clog up your hard drive. And when you're going through all the pictures from a session, when you're editing, it takes time to go through all the bad ones just to get to the good ones. It costs time. And not taking bad photographs in the first place, to me, is a good lesson to learn. I appreciate the simplicity of the hot shoes on mechanical cameras. There's only one pin on that hot shoe, and a single pin means you can only use manual flashes. There's no TTL. TTL being through the lens metering, the flash will fire a small pulse, the camera will record it and then tell the flash exactly how powerful it needs to be to get the correct exposure, or at least the exposure it thinks is correct. And that's my problem with TTL. You'll take the picture, assess it, see if it needs to be brighter or darker, and then use compensation to adjust accordingly. And if you're gonna do that, you might as well shoot manually. You take the picture, assess it, and make the light brighter or darker. In the film era, you'd have used a light meter or a Polaroid to test the exposures. In the digital world, you can just use the screen on the back. But with a single pin, you can use a remote from any manufacturer and it will fire. In fact, these mechanical cameras had PC ports that you could use a very standard PC sync cable to go from the camera to your strobe and it would fire perfectly. I think it was Sony that had a proprietary hot shoe where you could only put Sony flashes on a Sony camera. And I guess that didn't go down well because that mount did not last very long and they reverted to a regular hot shoe configuration. I appreciate that TTL would be a gift to event photographers and wedding photographers, people who have conditions changing them around them constantly. But for the majority of pictures that I take, a manual flash on a simple hot shoe seems to work really well. A lot of film cameras can be found at a very low price. They are, at the end of the day, old, used items. And because of that, you can afford to test out a couple of different varieties. And I think this is something that you can't do with digital photography. 
There are some photographers who like to try a little bit of everything and you do want an all round camera that can cope with a variety of situations. In a perfect world, you'd be shooting Leica on the street, Hasselblad in the studio, a Canon or a Sony at a sports event, but you're never gonna do that. It would just be prohibitively expensive. And maybe it was in the film days too, which is why the 35 millimeter full frame cameras are so popular. You want it to do sports and portraits and street photography, you want it to do video as well as stills. And that's a lot to ask. And I think that's why a lot of these cameras start looking the same. They've got no character. In the film era, you would get the right tool for the job. You'd go for a 35 millimeter camera because you could shoot a lot of frames in a second to capture the action of sport. You'd use a medium format camera or even a large format camera to shoot portraits in a studio, those large negatives giving a great quality of picture. You'd use a rangefinder or a tiny compact camera like the Rolly 35 to take discrete street photography. In the digital world, I do wonder if we should stop considering any camera to be a do-it-all camera. For a lot of photographers, eventually you'll niche down and you'll wanna get a camera that does the type of photography that you do very well. And in the mechanical film days, there were obvious choices. Without a niche, full frame cameras are probably the right choice. But if you know your genre, then it's always better to have the right tool for the job. Every time I pick up a film camera, I'm reminded of how pleasurable photography can be and how simple we can make it if we really wanted to. It's not as complex as a modern digital camera can be with all its buttons and dials and settings. Here, everything is at its basic level. Just the fundamentals that you need to have a good time taking pictures. It'd make my day if you subscribe to the channel and if you simplify your photography in any of the ways we've discussed in this video, I'd love to hear about how you're doing it in the comments below.